The Old Testament reading is taken from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, 1 through 14. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley. And behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones. Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover with you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. And you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on the slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and behold, and breath came into them. And they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord. And I open your graves and raise you from your, when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. And I will place in you, in your own, place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm is uh, reading is uh, uh, Psalm 139, 1 through 12. O Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before. You lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where, sh where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and I dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. The second reading is taken from Acts, chapter 2, 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. 
And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthenians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others, mocking, said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let it be known to you and give ear to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams even on my male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood. Therefore the day of the Lord comes, and great, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Rise for the Alleluia. <laughs> The Holy Gospel for the Feast of Pentecost is the Gospel according to St. John, the 15th chapter. These are the words of our Lord Jesus, who said, But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. But I have said these things to you, that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. I did not say these things to you from the beginning, because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, 
but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the Gospel of our Lord. We join together with Christians of all places and all times as we make confession of our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. Together, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, Light of light, light, very God, God of very God, God begotten, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all, all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from, from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and, and was made man, and, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. Pilate. He, he suffered and was buried. buried. And the, and the third day, day he rose, rose again, again according to the scriptures, and ascended, and ascended into heaven, heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead. His kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who is spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Proceeded to sing.
Spirit, enter in, and in our hearts your work begin. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters, do you ever need a breath of fresh air? Imagine that you're in a crowded room, a meeting room. Someone in back of you is smoking. Everyone is sweating. You feel as if you're about to suffocate. Excuse me, you say, as you push your chair back and make your way to the door, and you step outside with some desperation. Ah, fresh air, clean, cool. You relax, your head clears. Fresh air. That may describe something in the attitude as well as something in the atmosphere. Some of you, I would guess, during your working years have worked in a factory or office where things could get very stale or gloomy or even hostile at points. You know how people get on each other's nerves. But then perhaps there arrives a new employee, a sweet young gal, unspoiled, full of good cheer. Oh, she's a breath of fresh air around here, says one of the old timers. And it's true. Things brighten up when she's around. People loosen up. There's laughter again. This morning is Pentecost Sunday, a day in which God would bring us all a breath of fresh air, the clean, joyful wind of the Holy Spirit. The word of God I'd like to hold before you for a moment is that Old Testament lesson that was read earlier, uh, the lesson for Pentecost Day, Ezekiel 37. Rather a strange reading, an unusual reading. I'd like you to listen to just a part of it again and especially note references to breath. You remember that the hand of the Lord was on the prophet and brought him to a valley full of bones and told him to prophesy to the bones. The reading picks up in verse seven. So I prophesied as I was commanded and as I prophesied there was a sound and behold a rattling and the bones came together bone to its bone. And I looked and behold there were sinews on them and flesh had come upon them and skin had covered them. But there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are clean cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. So far this text. Well, the people of Israel needed a breath of fresh air, that's for sure. The year was 587 B.C. 
They had been carried far away into exile in Babylon. Their armies were all defeated. Their cities were plundered. Their once beautiful temple was gone now, replaced by a smoking ruin. Just imagine what that was like, sitting in a strange country, suffocating with hopelessness, and singing the mournful song, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost and we are clean cut off. A whole nation of dry bones, a people with one foot in the grave. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever stood by the grave of your own shattered hopes? Maybe it was a cemetery marker where you buried someone who meant the world to you. Maybe a bankrupt business that drained all your savings. A marriage that was broken beyond repair. A loved one stricken with mental illness. A church that died. The church I served for 11 years in Oregon City uh, before I got there, started a new mission in the town of Canby, about nine miles south. They named it the Church of the Master. Oh, it began in high hopes, but it wasn't long before it ended in gloomy failure. The church folded up. Some people were so delusioned that they disillusioned that they quit going to church altogether. Well, look around this morning. Look around at each other for a moment, or look quietly inside yourself. It can happen here, can't it? Even to people who are well-fed and well-housed and well-educated, people like us, people like us can be broken and dead on the inside. If you take a close look at yourself and at others in the around you in the congregation, you'll see something of the vision that Ezekiel saw, a valley of dry bones and dead hopes. And that deadness is no illusion and it's no accident. Paul says bluntly in Ephesians 2, you were dead in trespasses and sins. That's you, that's me. We are sinners. When we breathe, we've got bad breath. Even our breath smells like death. We begin to say things like, oh, I hate myself. I can't stand this life I'm living. There's nothing to live for. Life loses its color. I read that there is a museum, an art museum in Madrid, Spain. As the visitor enters the room containing the works of the great Spanish painter Goya, he senses immediately an aroma of death and despair. The paintings in that room are all done in dark, dreadful colors. The guide explains to the visitors, these works come from the dark period in Goya's life, the time when he lost his wife and feared he was losing his mind. Goya's paintings in that room depict what so many of us have felt. Our bones are dried up. Our hope is lost. Well, I have news for you. When we're suffocating like that, God hears our cry. Whether it comes from a lonely Spanish artist or a discouraged band of Jewish exiles, or from you or me as we struggle with deadly sins and deadened hopes, <clears throat> God hears. And when he hears, he raises an incredible possibility. He said it to Ezekiel, Son of man, can these bones live? Bones? Live? Suffocating hopeless people rising up to breathe free again? Dead men alive? Ezekiel answered and said, O Lord, thou knowest. Which is to say, only God knows. I sure don't. But look, as we stand there with Ezekiel among the dead in that valley, we meet an amazing sight. God brings the dead bones to life. When I grew up back in the 50s, there was a song even about this chapter. 
<clears throat> I'm going to venture to sing a little bit of it. Maybe you'll remember. Ankle bone connected to the leg bone, leg bone connected to the thigh bone, thigh bone connected to the hip bone. Now hear the word of the Lord. Nobody sang with me. I suppose you don't remember it. <laughs> but now look, muscles and tendons and flesh begin to clothe these old dry bones until they're no longer skeletons, but people, people with fingers and feet and faces. And yet, alas, their eyes are still closed in death. Finally comes the awesome finishing touch. Ezekiel is told to proclaim and prophesy once more. Come, O breath, and breathe on these slain. And then there is a stirring and a rush of wind, and they come alive. Eyes open up, faces smile, bodies start moving. It's a mighty army. You see, God Almighty is in the business of doing that, of breathing life into dead bodies, into dead people like us. Now, as wonderful as Ezekiel's vision was, I can tell you the best was yet to be. For on another morning, centuries later, God breathed into one particular lifeless body, one who was crucified, dead, and buried, and raised him to life, not merely in a prophetic vision, but in a warm flesh and blood reality. The disciples, think of this, had seen Jesus dead, and now they saw him alive. He was standing among them, promising to send them a breath of fresh air to overcome their deadness. The miracle of Pentecost is that God is still doing that, breathing fresh air into discouraged people. And it's no ordinary air. The Hebrew word for breath is also translated spirit. Suddenly we understand that strange detail that John reports. Remember the night that Jesus met with his frightened disciples, how he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Breath, the Holy Spirit. When I read about this some time ago as I prepared this message, I remembered years ago when I was an adolescent boy growing up in Indiana. I went swimming at a public swimming pool called Long Acre Park. I'd been in the park for an hour or so when I noticed at one end of the pool there was some kind of a hubbub, a gathering of people, a, a babbling of voices and other people running down that way. And I, of course, I ran down there too. I wanted to know what was going on. When I got down there, I saw something I didn't expect. I saw the inert form of a girl, maybe my age, laid down on her back on the concrete apron of the pool. She looked dead. Over her was hunched a lifeguard. He was administering CPR mouth to mouth while a crowd of people watched anxiously. None of us said a word. We watched, dreading what was happening. I was wondering, of course, if she were dead, but then I saw her move twitch a little and then begin to move more. I heard her choke and saw her start breathing. Mouth to mouth, she had received that life-giving breath. The girl was alive. It was like watching a little Easter right there at the edge of the pool. That's what Jesus did for his disciples when they were suffocating with fear and sadness. He breathed on them. Receive the Holy Spirit. Come alive, you fellows. So, okay, let's get it back to right now. What is it that suffocates you this morning in your personal life or in this church's life or in this country's life? What is it that makes you afraid or guilty or feeling empty? Whatever it is, let God breathe into you the breath of life, his son, Jesus Christ. Let the Holy Spirit resuscitate you and bring you back to living fully and joyfully. You might say this church is a lifeguard station. There's the fresh air of the Holy Spirit in here. 
the word read and preached, shared and sung and prayed, the holy sacrament administered, the encouraging presence of dear brothers and dear sisters beside you. But you know, sitting in church isn't enough by itself. There needs to be some breathing. Are you breathing? You're breathing, right? Okay. Breathing has two parts. There's exhaling and inhaling. Exhale, breathe out that stuffy air, that CO2, those sins and bad habits. Get them out as you speak an honest confession to God. God, I'm sorry. I haven't been what you wanted me to be. I've been gloomy and hopeless and grouchy. I confess it to you. And then comes the other part, the inhaling, taking in that good news, which Jesus assures, I died for you. I forgive you. I'm with you. Breathe it in. You know, God went to a lot of trouble to make this all happen for us. And he filled us with fresh air for a good reason. For he intended each one of us to use that in-breathed Holy Spirit to speak and to sing for him and to serve in his name. You know, every Sunday at church, after church is over, we go out to do what? Not wait six more days for next Sunday, but to go out and serve, to serve in his name. Sometimes churches even send teams of people to go somewhere to build houses or man soup kitchens in some way or other to be a breath of fresh air to people. And that, in fact, is your task and my task, even if we're staying right here in our neighborhood, to bring that fresh air that will bring other people to life, starting with the people who live right next door or across the street, or the people who call us on the phone or stop by. And you know you can't do that unless you breathe deeply and keep on breathing the Holy Spirit breath that sweet Jesus air. Let me give you another picture, sort of an ending picture here. Over the years, I officiated at a number of funerals, and at one of those, there was a memorable playing of bagpipes. The man was asked to come and play the bagpipes and pipe us into the church in a procession. Well, when the day came, I was back there with him watching in fascination as he made his preparations to lead our procession into the church. And the very final thing he did before the actual music began was that he, he began to blow the air chamber full of air, pumping it up like a balloon. And it sat under his arm like that. And when he was all ready, at last the chamber was full. Then finally he played and out came that wonderful piping music. It stirred our hearts, lifted us right into the church. And as he played, I noticed something else. He never stopped pumping air. He never stopped blowing that. He blew it into that chamber to keep the air flow going so he'd never run out of music. I'd like to suggest that's what God would have you do and me do. He would say to us on this Pentecost day, Receive that Holy Spirit of mine and keep breathing him deeply. Receive that good news of Jesus and keep meditating on it, praying it, praising it, sharing it. He fills us up and breathes into us the life that raised Jesus from the dead so that out of us will come that wonderful music, that new song that issues from the lips of the redeemed people like us. So I'll close very simply. Open the windows of your ears and heart, the chamber of your heart, and let that fresh air in. O oh, Holy Spirit, enter in, and in our hearts your work begin. In the name of Jesus. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.